السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن وله بإذن الله تعالى الحمد لله all praise to Allah سبحانه وتعالى that we are gathered here once again to study some aspects of the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it is the right of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that when his name is mentioned that the Muslims send salat and salam on him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do that <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he and his malaika also do that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayuhu alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi muhammad kama salli ta'ala ibrahim wa ala alihi ibrahim anna kahmidun majid Allahumma barik ala muhammadin wa ala alihi muhammad kama barak ta'ala ibrahim wa ala alihi ibrahim anna kahmidun majid As I mentioned to you before the reason for studying the seerah, it's a very important thing for us to think about the reason why do we study, study the seerah. The reason to study the seerah is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Rasulullah sallallahu as a demonstrator, as someone to show the world how to live. And how to live in this dunya? Well, so that the Akhirah is beautified and so that the Akhirah is made a place which is worthy of going to when we leave and go from here. It's a place that we will have to go to anyway. The question is how do we make that place a place of beauty and a place of reward. Unfortunately, the Sira is something that is not studied by the Muslims. Most Muslims do not have any idea about the life of Rasulullah Even those who make a, make a big show and song and dance about loving Rasulullah Just as a test, ask them to name the children of Rasulullah And I'll bet you 99% of them will not be able to name anyone other than Fatima Radhelana. And they, and they remember Fatima Radhelana also because of the Shias, not because of themselves. Eh? Ask them to name our mothers, the Azwajat Muttaharat, the wives of Rasulullah Wasallam. And perhaps except for Khadija Tulkubra Radhelana and Aisha Siddiqa Radhelana, they probably cannot name a third one. And that is not good enough. It is not good enough. We must study the seerah because to study the seerah is fard. When we said Ashadwanna Muhammad or Rasulullah, we said we have Iman on Rasulullah Sallallahu We said that we believe in him, we believe in his message, we believe in whom? How can we say we believe in someone we don't even know? How can you believe in someone you have no idea about? So it is very important, it is fard to study the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Second big reason to study the seerah is because the seerah has, <coughs> inshallah, answers in it for questions that we face in our lives on a daily basis. And this is the <coughs> beauty of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The entire life of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody's life is ordered by Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls everything. But the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was ordered by Allah and was arranged by Allah in such a way as to be an example for all of mankind to the end of time. 
So very special challenges were brought before him, very special things happened to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was shown how to face those challenges, how to solve those problems and issues as a consequence of which an example has been set for all of mankind till the end of time. And that is the reason why it's very important to study the seerah because the seerah gives us an idea <coughs> of what to do with our lives <coughs> no matter which century we live in and no matter which um, country we live in or no matter which nationality or race or gender we belong to there are lessons in the life of Muhammad Rasulullah for us. Rasulullah lived approximately 1400 something years ago, right? If I ask you or if you ask anybody in the world and say name for me one other person who lived in that time, somebody who is not a Muslim, because if you say name, with name one, one other person, they will, Muslims will name Abu Bakr Siddiq and Sayyidina Umar and so on. I am saying don't, don't worry about them. Name one other personality who lived 14, 1500 years ago who is remembered as much as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about whom as much is known in detail as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who is followed as much in detail as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who is loved as much as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ask, ask, ask anyone to name one person 14, 1500 years ago. Our own families we don't even know. I don't think anybody has got a lineage that long that you can trace it all the way back 1500 years. If people make that claim then it's more than likely it's all fictitious that they are claiming for something. I don't think there's any record of anybody that long. If you go back 300-400 years that itself is kind of major. Uh, more than that I don't think anybody has. So leave the families, but any figure, any random figure. Somebody might say Musa alayhi salam or Isa alayhi salam, but what do you know about Isa alayhi salam? Next to nothing. What do you know about Musa alayhi salam for that, for that matter? Except for what is narrated in the Quran. For example, do you know what Musa alayhi salam like to eat? I have no clue. Do you know how many wives Musa alayhi salam had? Did he have any children? If so, who were they? What were they? Boys, girls? What were their names? We know about the children of Ibrahim because of the Quran. We know about the wives of Ibrahim because of the Quran. The life of Rasulullah is a miracle in itself. The fact that it was the fact that he lived, the fact that his life was recorded and recorded in such detail, such amazing detail. People have reported what the bottom of the foot of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked like. Now can you imagine, people today they claim to have this love for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell me the, the person was recording that, was he doing it out of love or what? Nobody in the world can claim to love Rasulullah sallallahu as the Sahaba loved him. Nobody. People have, have, have reported Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu he reported in one hadith he said that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu woke up in the middle of the night towards the latter part of the night maybe 2 o'clock in the morning, Allah knows best. And he said he woke up, he sat up and he pointed a finger up at the sky and he recited the last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah from Aman al-Rasul to the end. Now Abdullah ibn Abbas when he reported this hadith was maybe 10-11 years old. He did not say Rasulullah woke me up. He said Rasulullah sallallahu woke up and did this. Which means what was, Abbas, what was Abdullah bin Abbas doing at that time? What does a normal 10 or 11 year old child do at 2 o'clock in the morning? 
You can't even wake them. If you want to try to wake them up, they won't wake up. I mean, it is simple. You throw water on his face, you do what you want. They sleep. They are in such dead sleep. Children of that age. If you are going somewhere, you literally have to carry that kid, put him in the car and take him away. Because there is no way that that kid is actually going to get up and walk. He won't walk. But here is an 11 year old kid who is in the khidmat of his sheikh who is also his cousin Abdullah ibn Abbas' cousin but he was a cousin of Rasulullah Sassan. but he was the Nabi and, he, and this boy was in the service of the Nabi so when the Nabi wakes up the boy is already awake before him then Abdullah ibn Abbas said I ran and to get some water for wudu and I brought the water and I poured the water and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made wudu and he said after he finished wudu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi made dua for this boy Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua for Abdullah ibn Abbas and he said oh Allah give him the understanding of the Quran and he said give him the ta'wil of the Quran make him explain your kalam Huh? That is the that is the wages of service. You do the khidmat of the Nabi, you get the dua of the Nabi. And Abdullah ibn Abbas was the first mufassir of the Summa. And he had an understanding of the Quran like nobody else. And that is why even in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab Umar ibn al-Khattab used to keep Abdullah ibn Abbas very close to him. And he would always call him and make him sit with him in all his majalis. And one day one of the senior sahaba, they asked him, he said, why do you always have this boy with you? So Umar ibn al-Khattab said, he recited Surah Al-Nasr, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ and he said, tell me the meaning of the surah. So one by one he asked the sahaba who were there. And these are all senior sahaba. So each of them told the meaning of the surah. This is what it means, this is what it means. And finally he came to Abdullah ibn Abbas. Who was much, much, much younger than all of them. He says, what is the meaning of the surah? And Abdullah ibn Abbas said, this surah announced the death of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said this surah was the announcement of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that the work of the Nabi had been completed So then Umar ibn al-Khattab turned around and said to the other Sahaba He said that is why I keep him here Because his understanding of the Quran is as a result of the dua of Rasulullah He said none of us have that The seerah of the Nabi <coughs> to study is also very important because to love Rasulullah Wasallam is a rukun of Iman. It is a requirement of Iman. It is fard on the Muslim to love the Nabi Wasallam more than he loves everything in this life, including himself. This is a condition of Iman. And the one who does not love Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam like that, Allah subhanahu wa taala promised His azab on him. <coughs> the famous ayah of Surah Tawbah, and I won't go into the tafsir of the ayah, but just to remind you and myself, where Allah subhanahu wa taala said, "Qul in kana aba ukum, wa abna ukum, wa ikhwan ukum, wa azwaj ukum, wa ashirat ukum." وَأَمْوَالُ نِقْتَرَفْتُمُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَا كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَاكِنُ تَرْضَوْنَهَا Eight things. أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ 
فَتَرَبَّسُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الْفَاسِقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, announce to them, say to them, declare to them <coughs> that if you love your parents and your children and your brothers and sisters and your wives and husbands and your families and the, 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 the wealth that you accumulate in trade and the businesses in which you feel you fear a loss and the houses you build and you look at them and you feel happy if you love any of these more than you love Allah more than you love his Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and more than you love jihad in, his fa- in, in the path of Allah jihad fi sabilillah Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said فَتَرَبَّسُ hatta يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِي وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمَ الْفَاسِقِينَ Allah said go and wait for the adab of Allah and Allah does not guide the rebellious people does not guide al fasiqun We know the famous hadith by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is walking in the street of Medina with a few of his companions. And he is holding the hand of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. His hand is in the hand of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, imagine what must be going on in the heart of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet ﷺ is holding his hand. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than I love everything in the world except myself. And this was the style of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in who when they had something in their heart, they were completely and totally clear about it. There was not a iota of duplicity in their hearts. And Umar al Khattab was famous for this. Whatever was in his heart, he would say it. He said, I love you more than anything except my own self. Rasulullah stopped and he looked at him and he said that Omar, your Iman is not complete until you love me more than you love everything else including yourself. Now see the beauty of the Sahaba. Sayyidina Omar ibn al-Khattab could immediately have said, oh but you know that's what I meant. He could have said that, which anybody normally would say something like this. No, no, but that's what I meant. Or he could have immediately said yes. But not Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab was silent. Because Umar ibn al-Khattab was looking within himself. He was looking into his own heart. And he was making whatever changes he had to make. And then he said, after some time, he said to him, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now I love you more than anything else including myself. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-An Ya Umar. He said, now O Umar. And the Muhaddithun have said, that by this, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have meant one of two things. One, he could have said, only now your iman is complete. And the other meaning could be, that, that till now this was your state. So it was a, like maybe a question, that till now this was your state. The meaning of both is the same, which means that the iman is not complete until we love Rasulullah wasallam more than we love everything including ourselves. And therefore that is the reason to study the seerah because how can you love somebody that you don't know anything about and finally a beauty of the seerah is that unlike everybody else in the world and even more so the celebrities and so on the more you know them the more closely you know them the less respect you have for them if you know them from a distance, then you respect them and you say, MashaAllah, this is, you know. But if you know them closely, 
one of my asatiza, may Allah bless him, he told me this about ulama. He told me, if you want to love an alim, don't get close to him. He said, if you want to really re respect an alim, stay a bit away from him. Don't get close to him. Don't get to know him well. Because if you get to know him well, you will lose respect. And may Allah forgive us. This is our state. This is our state. But this is not the state of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The more people knew him, the closer they came to him, the closer they got to him, the more they knew about him, the more they loved him. And that is another one of the beauties of the life of Rasulullah and that is one of the qualities of those who followed him. Because this is also true of the Sahaba, Rizwan Allah Alayhi and also inshallah of the good people of this of this ummah that you get close to them and your respect for them does not go down it respect for them goes up inshallah but certainly for Rasulullah it is something that is one of the miracles of the seerah that the more you study the seerah the more you love the Prophet and the more you respect him so having talked about all of these, let us bring it to today's time and age and the topic of this lecture which is leadership lessons from the life of Rasulullah And why do we need leadership lessons? Because leadership is the single biggest deficiency that we have in the world today. If there is one thing that the world lacks, that is leadership. And that's the thing which is so critically important, but it's also something which is uh, missing kind of big time. And therefore it's very important for us to learn the leadership lessons from the life of Rasulullah so that we can learn how to negotiate our way in the maze that we live in. Now why should we look at his life and society of that time? Because there is an uncanny resemblance. If you look at Makkan society and if you look at our society globally, there's a very uncanny resemblance between the two. And I've deliberately used some modern day phrases in the slide to illustrate because not that they use these phrases but that's how they lived. Makkan society just one generation before Rasulullah the Quraysh and others were people who were quite poor. Many of them were nomadic, they were quite poor and just a generation before him they started settling and they started doing some trade and they, the ones who became wealthy had been wealthy for not more than one generation. So they still had some very good memories, good meaning clear memories, not good in the sense of good, I mean these were memories of hard times. But they very clear memories of hard times when they didn't have money. So therefore like all people who are newly rich, we have this phenomena even today in the world. You know, the difference between old money and new money. The person who is newly rich is always, he wears uh, his shirt inside out so that the price tag is visible to the people. Right? And he always mentions, <laughs> And so all of that kind of stuff, right? Uh, and so also then, because this, these are people who are newly rich. So therefore money was number one important thing for them. And so they also believe that money makes the world go around, like we say, you know, in, in here, in our world today. Secondly, another characteristic of the newly rich, which is that if you got it, flaunt it, right? So whether it's money, whether it's whatever, showing off. So that the pleasure is not in using, but the pleasure is in seeing the other fellow's face turn green because you're using it. 
So there's no point in uh, driving a Mercedes when everybody else also has a Mercedes. So you're not interested in the car itself, you're interested in the fact that your car is bigger than everybody else's car. So that was the second element. Third one was <coughs> the person was defined uh, like, I mean, to in, in, the, in our modern terms, we call it brands or whatever. But it, that was the same context, which is the person was defined in terms of what they owned. So what kind of camel or what kind of a horse and so on and so forth and clothes. Close to the extent that one of the uh, characteristics of rich people was that they would wear clothes which dragged on the ground behind them as a mark of arrogance. And that is why Rasulullah said that if you drag your clothes on the ground behind you as a mark of arrogance, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will burn your ankles in the fire. So they did that. That was the kind of thing. Uh, food, ostentation, you know, huge uh, parties and then just food wasted and thrown. These were all signs of uh, people uh, of in the Ayyamu Jahiliya. Then another one, which is the poor had absolutely no status in society whatsoever. So anyone who was poor could be enslaved, could be killed, no one to ask any questions. Uh, women were like that, women were used as property to be used and disposed of as they wished. As we know, female infanticide was widespread, they would kill uh, the girls. Sayyidina Umar himself mentions this and he says that in the, in the days of uh, Jahiliya, he said, I had a daughter born to me and then he said that uh, when she was of a certain age, he said, I took her into the desert and I dug a hole in the ground and she was holding my finger and I laid her there and I covered her up with sand and she was still holding my finger and he said, after a while the grip relaxed. And he said, I regret it. He wept and wept and wept all his life and he made tawa to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. He said, this, was, this, was, this is how we were. He said, we were people like this, who could actually take our own child and bury her alive. So that is the state of that society. And religion was used, they were not religious, they were not religious people at all. Religion was a commodity, religion was to be used in order to get business for, for political reasons and so on. Uh, they practiced what suited them, what didn't suit them, they didn't practice and so on. So religion was something to be play, played around with, something which uh, was a source of money for them. And that's what the Kaaba was. And that's how the Kaaba ended up having 350 idols because uh, as far as they were concerned it was a place of pilgrimage. So somebody said, you know what, I, I brought my God and uh, I want to put it here and uh, next year my whole tribe will come. They said, no problem, please put your God because you want the business of all your tribe. So the next time the whole tribe comes now, new tribe is, is coming for pilgrimage. So anything is allowed. Someone says, I want to make tawaf of the Kaaba without my clothes, no problem. Somebody wants to do something, no problem. Anything is allowed. Why? Because the purpose is not worship. The purpose is to get people in order to have business. Now, if you take all of these factors uh, and look at our modern society today, you will find that there is an uncanny resemblance in terms of systems and processes and practices between what was happening in Makkan society and what is happening in today in our modern capitalistic um, what we call the market economy or whatever, whatever term you want to use we, we operate on exactly the same principles chief indicator of the health of a society is economic it's not moral, it's not character it's not education, it's not knowledge, it's not compassion, it's not, uh, you know, anything like that. It's purely money. Nothing more. Which is the best country? The one which has the highest GDP, the one which has the highest standard of living. And standard of living is defined purely and purely in terms of how many dollars per head 
per capita. How many dollars per capita in the country? Nothing else. Standard of living is that. Standard of living is not how moral are those people. Standard of living is not how pious are the people. Standard of living is not how well the poor are taken care of. Nothing. Per capita, how much is it? And as we know, that's a completely ridiculous calculation because in a society, if you've got, like in India, for example, uh, the top 1% or actually less than 0.01%, the top 0.01% control uh, more than 80% of the economy. So in a country where you have people who are dying of starvation, you have billionaires who are building houses which are, God knows how many stories? 36 stories, eh? 36. 36 stories. Amazing, eh? On misappropriated Muslim waqf land. So the point is that this is our society. We, <coughs> we exploit women. There's enslavement of women. Uh, unfortunately, the women who buy into that argument, they don't seem to see the way that they are being enslaved and they don't seem to see the way uh, that they are being exploited. Because they buy into the argument that this is freedom. They don't see how it's not freedom, it's actually enslavement, it's actually exploitation of women, uh, it's not equality of women, it's, uh, it's a blatant exploitation of women, but they don't see that. The poor have no say whatsoever in anything. The poor as good as don't exist. And that's our society. And also in Makkah of those days and in our world today, generally speaking, there is no sense of accountability to anybody for our actions. <clears throat> People feel that they can do exactly what they want, when they want, how they want, to who they want and there is no one that they need to account to or be worried about or concerned about whatsoever. Now, why am I talking about all these detailed comparisons? For a very good reason. And that reason is that the model of leadership that Rasulullah presented to the world was a model of leadership which solved those problems in those days. And therefore my submission to you is that if the problem is the same, then the same solution should work. And that's why we are saying that we believe that that medicine is effective because the disease is the same. It's an amazing situation if you think about the life of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that in a period of 23 years, this very small group of people starting from one person, which was poor, oppressed, uninfluential, changed from that situation to becoming rulers of the known world. How? And that is what inshallah in this lecture we will look at the leadership aspects of that uh, of that change. There are 11 lessons that we will go through inshallah today and tomorrow and maybe next weekend as well. I'll just list them here for you. One was complete certainty in his message. Everything begins with faith, everything begins with Iman and Yaqeen and that is the number one leadership lesson, complete certainty in the faith. Number two, no compromise with the message. No compromise for any reason whatsoever and we will see all of these with examples inshallah. Third one was personal leadership from the front, putting himself on the line. Not once, not twice, every single time. Number four was resilience. And resilience is to face the facts, 
while having absolute faith in success, facing the brutal facts without any window dressing, without any icing on any cake, but facing the facts as they are, but yet not getting, not falling into despair, uh, not losing hope, but having absolute faith in success. Number five, keeping the goal before everything else. The goal comes first, before personal preferences, before likes and dislikes, before every single thing else. Number six, living his message, not preaching his message. The Muslim is, the de is a demonstrator, he's not a preacher. Because people listen with their eyes. There's no point in talking something, we have to show that thing. Number seven is risk taking. The ability to take a chance. Banking on Allah. Number eight, sacrificing the short term for the long term. Number nine, magnanimity and forgiveness. Number ten, creating systems, transitioning from person led to process driven. And number eleven, succession planning and developing leaders. So eleven critical lessons from the seerah of Rasulullah which are key lessons for anyone who wants to lead. Inshallah my book is in the process of being written on this and in maybe in the next month or two that book will get published so all of these will be there detailed but let's talk about that anyway. So the first one is complete certainty in his belief and message. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first met Jibreel alayhi sallam in the cave of Hira and we know the whole story of the first revelation where Jibreel alayhi sallam said to him Iqra Bismi Rabbika alladhi khalaq and when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sallam had this experience he was very frightened, he came down from the mountain, came home and he said to his wife Khadijat al-Kubra radiallahu he said, Zambiluni, Zambiluni, he said, cover me up, cover me up and he lay down and she covered him up with a blanket and then when he had gained some level of composure, she asked him what happened. So he described to her his experience. The experience of two forms of life meeting one another. The experience of a man meeting an angel. The experience of one Rasul meeting another Rasul. The experience of a man listening to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the first time in his life. Eh? Reflect, I always say reflect. How many million times have you heard this story? How many of you have thought about this story? What does it mean? What does it mean to connect with Allah? Until we reflect, until we think, until we try to imagine, we cannot understand the magnitude of this experience. And she said to him, she said, Allah will not destroy you because you are good to your neighbors. You are kind to the poor people and you are generous as a host. You are generous as to your guests. All three issues of akhlaq. And then she took him to meet her cousin Waraka bin Naufal who was a monk and he was a learned man. And Rasulullah described his experience to Waraka bin Naufal. And Waraka bin Naufal, when he heard this story, he said to Rasulullah, 
He said, this is the same one who came to Musa Alayhi salam He said, he's the same one who came to Musa Alayhi salam He said, this is Jibreel Alayhi salam Rasulullah was afraid that maybe he saw a jinn and he didn't like jinn and he didn't like anything to do with magic and so on. And Barakah bin Nawfal said, no, this is no jinn, this is the angel. And this is the one who came to Musa alayhi salam, he brought wahi. And then he said a strange thing. He said that when your people throw you out of Makkah, when your people expel you from Makkah if I am still alive I will stand by you and I will support you now for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this was a strange thing he was the most loved man in Makkah he was a person who people gave a name and they called him Al Sadiq Al Amin he said they will throw me out of Makkah he said how is this possible how can these people throw me out of Makkah? Warak Abhi Nawfal said, I'm saying that because that always happens to the one who brings what you are bringing. He said, this always happens to the one who brings what you are bringing. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said in Surah Al Yaseen. Hmm? يَا حَسَرَةً عَلَى لِبَادِ مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِيُونَ Allah said حَسَرَةً عَلَى لِبَادِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Woe to the people There's not a single messenger of mine who they did not belie who they did not deny who they did not oppose And then for some time Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to worship and he hadn't yet got the order to go and communicate the message. And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave this hukum. And Allah said, Qum fa'anzir. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, go and stand and warn them. And that is when Rasulullah went and stood up on the mountain of Safa, on the top of the hill. And of course today everything is flat there because over the centuries how the haram has been built and so on, there is almost no hill anymore, there is just a little bit of, you know, on the end, you can see some rock. But there used to be a hill and Rasulullah climbed the hill and he stood on the hill. And he called out to the people, he said, Wa Subaha. And this was like an alarm call. This was like dialing 911 or something. Right? All the sirens and everything else, and you all the cop cars come. So Wa Subaha. And people start rushing out of their houses and came out of the market. He said, what happened? Because not only is the alarm call being given, but the alarm call is being given by the one who only speaks the truth. So which means that there is indeed something which is alarming, There's, there must be some danger, otherwise why would, of all people, why would Muhammad sallallahu why would he call Wa Subaha? So when they came, Rasulullah sallallahu said to them, he said, Oh people, if I told you that there is an army behind this hill, would you believe me? And they said, yes, you never lied to us and we will believe you. So he said, then believe me, when I tell you that I am a messenger of Allah, that I am the Rasul of Allah, and I have been sent and I have come to warn you of a severe punishment in the hereafter, if you continue to do what you do, which is if you continue on your polyeistic, polytheistic religion, on your idolatrous religion, on worshipping stones and rocks and all sorts of things, and if you continue to live in the kind of way that you live, I have come to warn you of severe punishment in the Akhira. Now he's calling these people out in the middle of the working day. And 
Abu Lahab's reaction quite clearly was not his alone. But that reaction demonstrates for us what kind of society it was. Because Abu Lahab, now who is Abu Lahab? Abu Lahab was the uncle. He was the brother of the father of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now in tribal societies among the Arabs, even to this day, the am, the uncle has the same level as the father. The way they greet the, fa- the uncle, the way if somebody, if, among the Arabs, if somebody calls you ammi, it's very big honor. It's not, it's not uncle like everybody calls uncle, you know, any unknown man is uncle. No, not, not with the Arabs. They call you ya ammi, they call you oh, my uncle, this is a big honor. Abu Lahab was the actual uncle he was, and Abu Lahab was a man when Rasulullah was born, Abu Lahab freed a slave and he gave gifts. He was so happy that my brother had a son. But the same Abu Lahab, when Rasulullah made this announcement, he came out and he said, Tabballaka sar al yawm, Ali hadha jamatina? He said, may evil befall you all the rest of this day. Is this why you called us here? Now it shows us the attitude of the society. What is he saying? He is saying, this is a working day. I am sitting in my shop doing business. I am buying and selling and so on. And you make me leave all of that to come and you tell me about some God and some Akhirah. What rubbish is this? What nonsense is this? Middle of the day, you're talking about all this, you know. So he's cursing him. Then may evil befall you. Because he considered talking about the Akhirah a waste of time. And for him to leave his shop, to for him to leave his business and come and listen to the word of Allah, to come and listen about the Akhirah was a waste of time. He said, you're wasting my time, man. You caught me for this. And I think that's a very good story to illustrate not only what Makkan society was like, but we can also see how closely it resembles our society today. How many people are there who consider it a good use of their time to go and listen to the zikr of Allah. Who give it preference. I mean there are people who might go there, oh chalo, you know, some good thing happening, I have nothing else to do. Alhamdulillah, even that is good. Instead of going to some evil place, you would have come here. But what about people? I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying instead of going to the cinema or instead of going to some bar, you, you come to the masjid. No, I'm not. I'm talking about will you actually shut your shop and come and listen to others? Will you actually give up your regular business, come during business hours and listen to a dars and listen to the dhikr of Allah? Only, only somebody with yaqeen in the, in the akhirah can do that. So Abu Lahab's reaction was this. Abu Lahab's reaction was that talking about the akhirah is a waste of time. Don't waste our time. And see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's response to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. Ma aghna anhu ma luhu wa ma kasab. Sayasla naran that lahab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Perish the hands of Abu Lahab. And may he perish. And his wealth and his children will not benefit him. Ma aghna, they will not, there's no gina, there's no benefit for him. Ma luhu wa ma kasab. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised he will be burnt in a fire of blazing flames. This surah is one of the miracles of the Quran. It's one of the dalail of the divine nature of the Quran. Because this surah came very early, it came. Abu Lahab lived long after this. 
And all that Abu Lahab needed to do to prove this surah wrong, Naudhubillah, all he needed to do was to go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and say, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad wa Rasulullah. Whether or not he believed it in his heart, even if he had just pronounced that kalima to Rabbi Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the matter would be over. The surah would be proved wrong. <coughs> but Abu Lahab lived for years after this. He never did that. And then the way he died also. He wasn't even killed. In the battle of Badr, everybody left. Abu, Abu Lahab sent somebody else. Instead of him, he didn't go. And when they came back, very soon after, he contracted a disease and died of that. And that disease was so infectious and it was so horrible that no one wanted to touch him. His own sons didn't want to go near him. So he died and he lay there for three days until his corpse was stinking. And the people told his sons, what is, how can you leave your father like this? So they took some long poles and they pushed him into a ditch and they threw stones. And they threw stones from a distance. I mean, Abu, Abu Lahab was actually stoned when he was dead by his own sons. They threw stones to cover up that ditch. That is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disgraced him in this life. And Abu Lahab was one of the aristocrats of Makkah. He was one of the nobility of Makkah. He was one of the wealthiest people in Makkah. And all that money and all that, all that fame and name and power did him absolutely no good. The lesson therefore from this is that it is essential for the leader to have complete faith in himself, in his own vision, his strategy, his mission, his method, and in the belief that anyone following him would benefit from doing so. The leader must believe that he or she is leading to something which is good and that anyone following them will benefit from following them. Because if the leader demonstrates the slightest doubt in his message, then the power of his leadership will be seriously compromised. And we see from the life of Rasulullah there's not a single instance where his faith wavered even slightly, never. And complete and total yaqeen on his message of Tawheed and on the fact that he was the messenger of Allah Jalla wa'ala. It's important for us to remember that people follow leaders for many reasons. Not everyone follows a leader for the same reason. I remember once I was speaking to the founder of uh, Infosys, Mr. Narana Murthy, and he said to me a very interesting incident. And this was in the heydays, it was in the uh, early 90s when uh, you know all stock prices were very high and And Infosys was known to be a company which probably had more millionaires than any other company in the world. You know, car drivers were, were millionaires and, and ordinary programmers were millionaires because of the shares that they held in the company. And Mr. Murthy told me an interesting story. He told me, he said, that when we started this company, he said, we started this company with a share capital of 10,000 rupees. There were seven of us. And then when we needed money, he said we didn't go to the banks because they are against interest. He said interest impoverishes, interest does not help. So there's no borrowing, never borrowed any money from any bank. Hmm? So he said we went to private people to ask for money. So he said there were three kinds of people that I encountered. He said there were people who genuinely believed that I was worth supporting. They genuinely believed that I would deliver. So they put money because they said yes, even though we don't see the signs of it just now, if this guy says it will happen, it will happen. So they had faith in me, so they gave me money. 
He said there were another kind of people who said, well, you know, I don't really think this guy will deliver, but you know, after all, he's my nephew or he's my brother or he's my something. So, I mean, I can't just tell him, get out. You know, I have to give him some money. So, they gave me. So, that means these two kinds of people had shares in Infosys. He said there was a third kind of person. He said that person flatly refused to give me money. I'm offering them shares of Infosys. Please buy some shares. They said, no, sorry, not interested. He said, today, those people come to me and they tell me, you should have forced me. You should have forced me. Why didn't you force me? Murthy says, well, how can I force anybody? You know, I offered you the share. You didn't want it. Now when the share is worth $200, <laughs> and now when you, now when you see, you know, I, go, I was offered 10,000 shares, for 10 rupees each or whatever it was, I don't know exact numbers, but you know, he said, when I was offered those shares, and now you do your mental calculations, and say, my God, I could have been a millionaire, but today I have nothing. He said, they come to me and they say, you should have forced me. Why didn't you force me? And Mr. Murthy said, how can I force anybody? And subhanAllah, this is the nature of things, that today, when you take Islam to people, and you offer it, and say, here is the ticket to Jannah. There are some people who will politely listen. Not because they are convinced or anything, but they listen. Since you are here, you know, I can't tell you, get out, so I will put up with you for a while. There are other people who run away. The moment they see you coming, say, get out of this place, you know, let's not be here. And there are some other people who either try to throw you out or they throw themselves out. You know, they walk away. I'm sorry, not interested. But a day will come. And may Allah protect us. A day will come. When all those people who walked away. And all those people who threw you out. Will then on that day they will cry tears of blood. And they will say, oh, if only we had listened. If only we had listened. And on that day, they will be willing to ransom themselves with, the, with, with gold as much as the earth can contain. And it will be said to them, that today, there is no ransom for you. And on that day, you were asked for much less than this. So it is very important for the leader to be firm because people follow leaders for all sorts of reasons some see benefit for themselves some some do it for affiliations and some do because they see the leader is powerful and therefore it is suits us to be on the good side of this leader because you know he's a powerful guy you don't want to cross him so I don't really like him I don't really support him but you know we don't want to go against him so all right we support we, we, you know we show support but then you will find that if you are actually leading to something good and you remain firm on your path, then gradually the trickle becomes a flood. Gradually people gather and gradually there is a following. And that's the reason why your own passion, your own belief and your own desire to work only and only to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a very critical element of leadership. Because if you don't have that, then you can't give it. Because you can only give what you have. And that's why to me, I always say that dawah is a matter of the heart. You can only invite to Allah if you love Allah. You cannot invite to Allah if you have no love for Allah. You cannot invite towards Allah if you have no connection with Allah. There was no Nabi who did not love Allah. There was no Nabi who was not connected to Allah. And that's very important for us to assess for ourselves and say, where am I with respect to my own connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The da'wah of the Anbiya was clear and direct. Rasulullah didn't beat about the bush directly to the point 
leave what you are doing and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala otherwise you are in serious trouble he didn't say it in a nice way he didn't say it in a soft way he didn't say it in a sugar coated way he didn't put it like, like, like a hidden cookie inside a cake no direct straight to the face in so many words no convoluted philosophies Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all the Anbiya they spoke when they spoke they were conscious of the power of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions the story of Musa Alayhi Salaam before Firaun and I mentioned this before and I won't repeat it here but if you remember those ayat of Surah Al-Shura the one thing which comes out clearly absolutely from those ayat is that Musa alayhi salam was hearing some other voice in his head. When he was talking to Firaun, he was not hearing what Firaun was saying. Whatever Firaun was saying or not saying made no difference to Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam was listening to something else. His ears were tuned somewhere else. And what Musa alayhi salam was saying was what he was programmed to say. And so also with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. Abu Lahab said whatever he wanted to say and then of course things difficulties only increased if you see the whole of the period of Makkah if you look at it purely with worldly eyes if you look at the entire period of 13 years of Makkah it's a story of failure it's a story of failure it's a story of progressively bad going to worse from bad to worse one after the other one after the other failure after failure after failure difficulty after difficulty after difficulty but through all of that you do not see any despair in Rasulullah you do not see any discouragement in Rasulullah you do not see any softening of stances you do not see any lack of energy in his work why because he is conscious of the power of Allah and the rest of what is happening around him doesn't matter whether it's one person listening to him or 10,000 people listening to him or 10 million people listening to him makes no difference because he is conscious only of pleasing one and that is Allah his reliance is only on Allah he is not relying on his tribe or his family or his wealth or his education or his personal charisma or his personal influence or nothing 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 reliance is purely and purely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he seeks no reward from the people this is the, one of the hallmarks one of the distinguishing features of the dawah of the Ambiya that they never took a reward and they never took money from the people they worked only for Allah's pleasure and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this in Surah Al-Shura and other places with respect to Nabi after Nabi after Nabi the one distinguishing feature which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned was that they do not la as'alukum alayhi ajra that they do not ask for ajr from you they don't ask for reward from you the one distinguishing feature of every single Nabi and then in Surah Al-Anam Ayah number 90 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentions in the ayat before that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he gave them the books and the so on and so forth and he's talking about the Anbiya and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah says أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَ اللَّهُ فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقْتَدِهُ قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرَةِ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرَى لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah says they are those who? the Anbiya are those who Allah had guided so follow their guidance the Anbiya came to be followed the Anbiya came to be obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directed us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directed us Ulaika Ladina Hadallah. These are the people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Hidayah. Fabi Huda Humuktadi. Therefore, do their iqtida. 
follow them, obey them. And what is their distinguishing feature? That they say, we don't want anything from you. We do not ask for any ajar from you. We don't want a salary from you. We don't want a gift from you. We don't want any money from you or any other thing from you. We are doing this purely and purely for Allah. And that is the source of barakah in the work of deen. Those who take money for the work of deen will never see this. They will never see the barakah of the work of deen. Because the method of the Anbiya was to do it purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Anbiya, all the Anbiya had their own source of income for themselves, separate from the deen. <coughs> they never took money for their work. Some of them had sheep and, and cattle and some of them had farms or whatever it was and Dawud salam used to make armor and Somebody was a carpenter, Isa a.s. was a carpenter, various people had different traits. But they never took money for the work of deen. They never took money to teach anybody Islam. And that was the source, that was the source of their strength. That was the source of the barakah in their lives. And that's why I say very clearly to people, you want to do the work of deen, never take money for it. Find another source of income. And if you can't do that, leave it. Just do your faraya, that's enough for you. Don't adulterate the work of the Ambiya by making that work a source of income for yourself. We'll take a break.